song For every bomb that flies I'd sing each and all the days If there were to be a verse For every dying child's cries For every helpless father's gaze Bringing peace and social justice issues into your living room piece by piece. I'm your host, Pat Miner, and we've been discussing in the last few weeks the Israel-Palestinian issue, and today we have with us a very special guest. We have George Abuid, who's going to tell us a little bit about his organization, the, the pa Presbyterian Peacemaking Program, what he does there, and how he got involved with it. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Okay, my name is George Abuid, and I'm from Palestine, from the city of Jesus, Bethlehem. And uh, I've been here in the United States since uh, three weeks and a half, something like that. Um, I chose to come to participate in this peacemaking program as a way to speak to as many people as possible in order to educate them and give them a new perspective, a new narrative that they are not familiar with because I know, uh, oh, actually, I knew that I'm coming to the United States, which is probably the most toughest place ever that, uh, you know, that all people here are unconditionally support Israel and there is a lot of support for Israel and dominating one narrative. So I thought like I have to take this challenge and come here to speak to as many people to educate them and make them think out of the box as a way to create new perspective. So um, how I got involved with this project is of this program. Uh, I'm working with the Annunciation Church which is uh, actually a Palestinian church uh, um, a Lutheran church and uh, this church has been involving for more than four years and a half in a nonviolent uh, protest going mm -hmm. on in our city Beit Jala which is two minutes away from Bethlehem and we have been protesting in nonviolent way uh, as a way to uh, protest the illegal uh, Israeli activities inside the West Bank especially in my, in my town Beit Jala which has been seriously affected by the Israelis uh, settlements expansion and building the settlements. Uh, so uh, I'm part of this church, and uh, I got an, a guy who's who was really in good contact with the Presbyterian Church in the United States, and he said, and they, and he said, like they wanted somebody from Palestine who could speak about life under occupation as a Christian, uh, who could speak on behalf of the whole Christians in the society. So uh, he said, uh, I think you're good to go for it. And uh, I told him, yes, I would love to do that. And as I said, I accepted the challenge. And um, he put me in contact with the principal of, or the organizer of this, pro of this program. And uh, I, s I talked to him and uh, he accepted me and he said, you're welcome here. Great. Yeah. And so you've been, been two or three places since before you came here? Yeah, yeah. I was in Louisville for orientation. Uh -huh. And then I went to Pittsburgh for about five days. Uh, after that, I headed to uh, Baltimore for more than uh, six days where we had intensive meetings with congressmen staff. Uh, mm, nice. Each one, each one, uh, I think, is, well, uh, is about 45 minutes. It was really intense, and I think it was effective hopefully good. and uh, yeah and then I have been into Iowa since uh, four days or five days something like that mm -hmm. great and um, then you're gonna go to Minnesota did you yeah, say I'm, I'm going to Minnesota afterwards okay and you've been talking to congressmen and s senators we tried to talk to many staffs some of them were uh, paying attention I would say yeah and uh, some of them were probably don't care or actually uh, not interested in the issue, I would say. Uh, so, yeah, congressmen, staff, many people uh, from the Presbyterian, uh, several people at the Presbyterian churches, uh, at the sanctuaries, uh, where else high school students. Uh, mm -hmm, I was talking right. to high school students yesterday. <coughs> and uh, also, I had a very group, uh, a very big group in Baltimore. Uh, I had about like 250 uh, high school students. I talk to them, so I'm trying to speak to as many people as possible here to try uh, to make them all actually like just to create a, a public awareness here in the United States. Right, right. Well, we re really appreciate your coming and, Thank you. and uh, helping us do that. Yes, absolutely. And so 
Do you want to tell us what you've been discussing with those people? Yeah, I've been actually um, explaining life under occupation as a Palestinian Christian and as also as a Palest uh, like the life of the whole Palestinians today, not only the Christians, but the Christians' population is, has been severely shrinking mm -hmm. uh, through the past uh, years, and especially during the so-called peace process, where unfortunately there hasn't been any peace and there hasn't been any process. Uh, the thing is, I've been uh, illustrating and, sh and sharing my stories that happened to me uh, for the past 24 years while I was living in, uh, in Palestine. And uh, I was explaining the situation, the checkpoints that we have to go through on a daily basis, and what we suffer on, uh, from the Israeli legal activities on the West Bank, such as the expansion of the settlements and the loss of our land and uh, the demolition of our houses and the uprooting of our trees, etc. all these illegal settlements. And the organization that I used to work for, which is uh, called Arij Applied Research Institute mm -hmm. Jerusalem, is just one of the great institutions that actually try to collect all these information about the illegal activities of the Israeli soldiers and the Israeli, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, the Israeli soldiers and what they do to the Palestinians on a daily basis, how the Palestinians suffer, and we try to collect all these information and, public it, and publish it at large, uh, internationally and locally. We have been inviting several representatives uh, from several places around the world in order to, uh, uh, to show them and to raise public awareness for them for what's what has been happening to the Palestinians for the past two decades of peace. And uh, yes, moreover, also like uh, I was explaining that the two-state solution today, the window of the two-state solution, unfortunately, is closing, closing on a daily basis as long as the occupation is continuing today on the lands of the Palestinians. Not only this, uh, I believe, I strongly believe, like uh, there is no hope for the two-state solution today after you, you've seen like the map of the West Bank today, as you can see here, it's completely uh, unjust and uh, I would love to illustrate. Yeah, let's look at this. Yeah, so basically this is the West Bank. This is, this is actually the process of two decades of peace today where, as I said, there hasn't been any peace, uh, there hasn't been any process where you only see an occupation in trenches on a daily basis. So the red line here is the segregation wall which separates the Palestinians from the Israelis today. Here is Israel, here is Gaza, and this is the West Bank. Now, these yellow shades, as you see here, is where the Palestinians live today, and mainly known as Area A, according to Oslo Accords 1993. Which means? Which means that they have an autonomy, but not a sovereignty on these, uh, on these areas, because obviously the Israeli soldiers raiding these areas on a daily basis overnight and, and so on. Anyway. The blue shades is where the Palestinians are living today. Uh, uh, sorry, the yellow shades. The blue shades here is where the Israeli legal settlements, as you can see, are surrounding every town and uh, city in the West Bank. Today, or oh, actually, just to give you a small statistics, in, in 1993, um, there were only 150 settlements or so. Today, there are more than 200 plus settlements. Moreover, in, in, uh, the, at the beginning of the peace process, there were only 200,000 illegal set settlers living in these illegal settlements. Today, after two decades of peace, unfortunately, there are more than 600,000 settlers living in these uh, illegal settlements. But what most of you know is these, these settlements are not legal according to me, but according to international law, according to Geneva Fourth Convention, and other international institutions that have been saying like, this West Bank is where the Palestinians should establish their own state. Because already the city or the state of Israel has been established, now it's, ta it's time for the Palestinians to establish their own state. So uh, as you can see, it's uh, completely disconnected areas uh, uh, as a result of the illegal activities of the Israeli government in this area. And not only this, there's a complete segregation today in the West Bank and probably worse than what happened in South Africa, a complete apartheid. The Palestinians don't see Israelis, the Israelis cannot see the Palestinians. And one of these uh, uh, faces of this uh, separation issue is 
the bypass is the bypass roads as you can see here the bypass roads actually bisecting every Palestinian cities and towns and are connected mainly to the throughout the settlements and by the settlements to Jerusalem where it's supposed to be the capital for both people East Jerusalem for the Palestinians and West Jerusalem for the Israelis and so on these bypass roads are exclusively for Jewish people which means the Palestinians cannot drive on them so and moreover more importantly is in, pa in the West Bank the Palestinians are subjected to military law which means they are subjected to checkpoints detentions without trials and uh, curfews where the settlers in the West Bank are submitted to uh, Israeli civil law which means they are treated as citizens so this illustrates clearly what we are living in which means like uh, we are living into two, uh, two unequal uh, laws moreover as long as the, the occupation continues it's still like one, pro one people have more privilege than the others. So I don't think like the people on, who's living in this area can, can sense uh, a way of hope, a way of peace in this, uh, as you can see in this map. Not only this, that's a problem because uh, if you think like you're talking about peace without uh, creating, <coughs> without creating, uh, um, without creating a sense of hope between, or without creating a sense of reality, between the people who are living there that peace is happening there can never be a peace or even possible or even right. possible or even possible absolutely and that's why and that's why absolute uh, people in that country lost hope because they have suffered enough and they're still suffering till today as long as the occupation continues yes well uh, just in full disclosure to both my listeners who may know this by now and, and to you, I've been to Palestine myself three times, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, not since 19 or 2005, though. So mm -hmm. uh, I know that things have increased mm -hmm. um, dramatically. dramatically since then. Mm -hmm. And um, I, actually, we went to Arij, so oh, okay. I've been there a so you're times, probably so. familiar with that. Yep. Okay. Yep. A little bit familiar with what they're they've been doing, and mm -hmm. and. Um, what can you tell us about conditions on the ground now? Conditions on the ground now. Uh, I'll just give you, like, I will share with you small stories of yes. what happened to me. And you probably, you could sense what's happening on the ground. And it's not only, it's not an individual case. Unfortunately, it's happening on a large scale. And yeah. to almost every Palestinian who's still living back there. So I could share with you what happened to me in 2011 which is uh, still vivid in my memory and unfortunately will never ever leave me. What happened is I was attending uh, Birzeit University. Birzeit University, as you can see here, in Ramallah city. Now, before all these obstacles, you, you, usually the road from Bethlehem to Ramallah takes half an hour if you cross from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and then to Ramallah. But today, unfortunately, after, uh, <coughs> after two decades of peace, as you can see, to go from Bethlehem to Ramallah, you need to cross through three main checkpoints. Two of them are uh, easy to pass, I would say, and the third, of the, the third one, which is located at the entrance of Ramallah city, is completely difficult to pass through. So, uh, the thing is, what happened is, I was attending my university, as I said, and I was doing one of my final exams. And the exam was supposed to take place at 8 a.m. in the morning. And uh, I thought, like, I have to go out of home around 6 o'clock in the morning in, over, in order to be able to cross these checkpoints and to arrive to my university and to prepare myself for the exam. What happened, unfortunately, uh, I passed uh, the first checkpoint and the other one, but I got stopped by the last checkpoints. Now, you might wonder, like, what do Palestinians do at these checkpoints? Well, basically, they have to show their IDs. If the Israeli soldiers were in a good mood, they'll let you through. If they were in a bad mood, they'll keep you there forever. And that's exactly what happened. I had to show my ID here in this, uh, this checkpoint, which, known, which today is known as one of the enormous checkpoints in the West Bank. It's called Kanalnia checkpoint. And it's located at the entrance of uh, Ramallah city. And uh, they stopped me there for more than four hours. And you don't know what's the reason. They just like were in a bad mood, as I said. And, uh, of course, as you can imagine, I arrived late to the exam. And when I entered the exam hall, the teacher looked at me and said, where have you been? I told him, I'll explain myself later because I don't want to interrupt the students who are doing the exam. 
So he said, uh, okay, get out from here. You're not allowed to do the exam anymore. Meet me at my office. I went to his office in order to explain myself, uh, but unfortunately he was really frustrated and angry and because I missed the exam. And he said, again, where have you been? I told him, like, I got stopped by one of the checkpoints and uh, you know the situation better. So he said, and his, his words still vivid in my memory till today, and I shall never ever forget them, where he said to me, this is not my problem. You have to get used to it. Mm -hmm. So basically, the occupation has become one of my problem, and I have to get used to it. Moreover, what happened afterwards is like he kicked me out of his office, and he said, I'll see you next semester. You have to repeat the course mm -hmm. next semester. And obviously, I was late for graduation. So this is just what you have to go through on a daily basis to travel from one place to another. More importantly, about these checkpoints, today, these checkpoints do not separate Palestinians from Israelis. These, Palestinians, these checkpoints today separate Palestinians from Palestinians. They are located at every entrance of every town and city, restricting the Palestinian movement from one place to another. So what's the purpose of these checkpoints? Probably just like to give you an impression that we are here in power and you are under oppression and you are under occupation. Just to give you this sense of impression, I would say. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Did you finish your schooling time? I did. I did. I graduate and I have a bachelor's degree now in political science and uh, philosophy mm -hmm. and a minor in uh, public administration. Mm -hmm. And I speak almost four languages, Arabic, English, uh, Italian, and a bit Spanish. Great. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this kind of a situation that you have to go through. Another issue, which is, I think it's uh, probably really important to mention here in the United States is the water issue. The Palestinians in the, in the West Bank are really suffering from the water issue. And there is, there's actually a great infographic uh, by uh, EWASH, which is uh, an international organization, illustrates clearly the situation of water back in Palestine. The Israeli claims that the Palestinians don't get enough of water. But unfortunately, uh, or not unfortunately, luckily, this EWOSH uh, uh, infographic shows clearly, or illustrates clearly, that the Palestinians, or Ramallah city, has more annual rainfall than London itself. You might not believe that, but it is true. <laughs> that is hard the, to believe. Not only this, not only this, the, the, oh, actually in Palestine lies the largest portion of water in the whole Middle East. But still the Palestinians regulated the use of this water. And if you ask why, it's simple, because Israel controls all water resources. Not only this, it says that the World Health Organization uh, recommends to function as a normal human being. I mean, to function as a normal human being. You need at least 100 liters of water per day, which is equivalent to 25 U.S. gallons here in the United States. The Palestinians, because Israel controls all water resources, consume... 70 liters of water per day, which is equivalent to 18.5 U.S. gallons here in the United States. On the other hand, the Israelis, because they control all water resources and deny the Palestinians access to it, they live in two uh, different, two different uh, uh, law of, of using water there. So the Israelis consume 300 liters of water per day, which is equivalent to 76 U.S. gallons. So can you imagine? Now, you might wonder, like, what do Palestinians do when they are out of water or when they have a shortage in it, which is, happens on a regular basis, on a daily basis, every month? What happened is, is these Palestinians have uh, to go, or actually they have two choices, I would say. One of them is to wait until Israel pours it into the West Bank. And the second one is they have to buy new tanks of water, which is extremely expensive and costs 360 shekels, equivalent to 100 US, gallon, a US dollar. You might say 100 US dollars, not too bad, but these people who are, who are living in refugee camps and living in abject poverty, no opportunity for life, no jobs, no decent jobs, I would say, no decent life at all, it's extremely expensive for them and they can't afford to buy it every single month. So what do they do? They try to seek new water resources and sometimes they are in a bad condition and not healthy. And they try to bring, to bring some back home in order to function the rest of the day. but. This is what they have to go through on a daily basis. So they live in two, system, two unequal system of water back in Bethlehem. And no wonder why Israel here is never 
or will never ever leave this, uh, this area is called Area C, where Israel has full control over this land, which constitutes 60% of the West Bank, the majority of the land there. The problem with, in this area, the Palestinians are not allowed to build or to flourish over there. Moreover, most of the Israeli settlements are located here in the Area C. And not only this, this where the area where the, all the aquifers, the main aquifers to the West Bank that leads to the West Bank, the water in the West Bank are located. And that's why the Israelis control all the water resources there. Second thing to understand why Israel will never ever give up these, uh, these settlements is because this considers the first shield to defend itself, its border from Jordan. So it's keeping itself uh, protective from Jordan and at the same time providing uh, uh, prohibiting the Palestinians from having an access to the water resources and, of course, gaining all, the, all, all aquifers there. So this is just another, uh, another system of unequal uh, laws that goes there in the West Bank today, as you can see. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious to me that the Palestinians don't have as much water. I've seen graphics that show Last night I was looking at something where you have uh, the Israelis, I think it's important to understand that these settlements aren't just, um, they, they look like they're green mm -hmm. and they have, um, you know, and this is no, a yeah, desert. Yeah, like, exactly, you, desert. You, might, you might wonder like what, are these, what, what these settlements are. No, the settlements is like any city, any, any, any state, like they have everything. They have uh, they're, they're factors, green. malls, schools, universities, everything. They have everything. Uh, swimming pools. Swimming pools, of course, and uh, because they have a large portion, uh, portion of water where the Palestinians have to suffer on a daily basis. So yeah, they have almost everything in these cities. And any idea to withdraw from these settlements, which means... It's, it's impossible. I mean, the Israeli government uh, will never allow this. That's why it's still keeping or holding most of its land in the West Bank. We'll talk about more about um, what might a solution be mm -hmm. later. But um, for the moment, let's just talk about a little bit. You know, I, you mentioned that um, they'll never give up Area C. Mm -hmm. um, but because it's a, because it's a buffer mm -hmm. between... Jordan and the Palestinians, and, the Palestinians. and it yeah. also keeps the Palestinians away from the aquifers. From the aquifers, yeah. Yeah, and um, so if if they keep all of that land, and the settlements are, they keep all the set the larger settlements. Mm -hmm. Which if we go ahead, point these out yep. here, here, and here, here and here, and, and here, here mm -hmm. uh, that and. So then, what percentage of the of what's, what's left, left for the Palestinians? Will be Palestinians. The Pal yeah. Actually, the West Bank is supposed to constitute <coughs> 18 or 22 uh, percent for the Palestinians to live in. Today, unfortunately, with the settlements and all uh, the bypass roads and the checkpoints, etc., the Palestinians have left with less than 8 percent. Because that's another another thing we we should mention is that not only do the roads connect. Uh, settlement to settlement, mm -hmm. but they're Israeli-only roads. Yeah, exactly. As I said, exclusively for Jewish right. people. Exclusively for Jewish people, and and you might ask, how do they know that? And that's because because they don't see checkpoints at all. They don't. They are not submitted to checkpoints. And of course, the yellow plates. Right. The yellow plates where the Israelis, the Israelis has a uh, yellow plates for uh, car for their cars, and the Palestinians have uh, green and white. Plates. So if you're driving down down the road, mm -hmm. the, the Israeli soldiers know whether uh, right or not, away, whether of you're course. Palestinian. Of course, right away. Because they can, you have a different right away. thing. Right away. So if you're traveling through a checkpoint by car, mm -hmm. they immediately see who, who's carrying the Palestinian Yeah, citizens. speaking also of Jerusalem, uh, it's very important also to understand, like, uh, it's, to, 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 act, to have an access to Jerusalem is a completely different issue. Because to have an access to Jerusalem, you need special permits, and entry permits, I call them. And the $100 million question is like, how do these Palestinians get these permits? Actually, they only can get it twice a year, during Easter and during Christmas. I mean, for the Palestinian Christians who live in the West Bank. So they only can get it twice a year, as I said, during Easter and Christmas. And uh, third one is probably an emergency. 
during the emergency situations, if you are sick and you need to be treated at one of Jerusalem's hospitals. Now, the thing is, how do they get these permits? It's like you have, they have to apply to one of the closest Israelis administration in the West Bank or near Bethlehem or near Ramallah or whatever. And after a week or so, you receive your permit if you receive it and if you're lucky. So, uh, what are, what one, of the, uh, one of the stories that I can remember in 2011, what happened to me is, and my family, is actually during Easter, people try to get these permits or gain these permits in order to have an access to Jerusalem to go to pray at the Holy Sepulchre uh, for Good Friday and Holy Saturday. So Easter is considered one of the most important events that could happen in a Palestinian life, a Palestinian Christian life, I would say. So they try to get permits in order to go to Jerusalem. And uh, what happened is my dad went to apply for permits on behalf of the whole family. After a week or so, or after a week in advance before Christmas, uh, I received a permit. My dad received one. Unfortunately, my mom, my sister, my brother didn't get anything. Hmm. So uh, the whole family, we couldn't go the whole family, just me and my dad. We need to go all together to Jerusalem to celebrate at the Holy Sepulchre. So that didn't happen, and unfortunately, our Easter were ruin was ruined, and uh, we had to stay and celebrate Easter in Bethlehem, while most of the Palestinian Christians in town are celebrating in Jerusalem. So this is another way to divide the people. Uh, and not only this, like even if you see Jerusalem during Easter and, and Christmas, uh, even if you have a permit to enter Jerusalem, you can see like the Israelis are erecting uh, several checkpoints or barricades in, to prevent the Palestinians from entering to. Uh, to the whole sepulchre, so you'll see like it's a complete shut down city. And uh, even if so, even if you so that's so that's mean if you even if you get a permit, that doesn't mean you're guaranteed 100 percent to go and to enter the whole sepulchre. So it might face another barricade Israelis down uh, down in Jerusalem. And some people, uh, what most of the Palestinians do, they just give up. They said like, I'm not gonna take this chance and just like just wait here for hours to pray at the whole subject I'll just go back home and celebrate at at home so this is what most of the Palestinians do when they get an access to Jerusalem sometimes they feel hopeless and they just go back home so this kind of a situation in Jerusalem what we suffer during Easter and Christmas you hear sometimes <clears throat> it's said that one of the reasons that the that the Christians are leaving mm -hmm. um, the the Palestinian land mm -hmm. is that is because of uh, Muslims. Uh -huh. Do you think that's true? No, that's not, absolutely not true. I'll give you uh, just a small pop a small statistics to clearly illustrate what has been happening during the two decades of peace. Bejala, my city here, Bethlehem, Bejala, it's here. Bejala has uh, been seriously affected by the Israeli legal settlement, two legal settlements, which is Gilo and Hargilo as you can see here. Now, the Christian population in Bethlehem in general, Bethlehem district, which constitutes Bethlehem, Beit Jala, and Beit Sahur, used to constitute 70% of its population as Christians. Today, there are less than 3%. And if you ask why, they just couldn't afford it. It's extremely mm -hmm. difficult for them to live there under occupation. Most of their lands has been confiscated, uh, which, which used to constitute a great income for them and their main source of income. I'll give you just uh, another story, what happened to my dad. We used to own a land in what's so-called Gilo settlements today. And it was about 4,000 acres. These 4,000 acres were uh, full of grapes, uh, figs, uh, olive trees, uh, vegetables, fruits, whatever you can find there. So Palestine is an agricultural country. And most of its people depends on their income from what they can get from their lands. So my dad and uh, his, uh, his father, which is my grandfather, used to go in the morning and collect whatever they could from their land and go next morning to sell it in the market. And this used to constitute a great income for them. So basically, when you, when you lose your land, it means automatically you lose your main income. And this is what happened to most of the Palestinians, not only my dad. Most of the Palestinians, Christian and Muslims who have been living there and uh, has suffered dramatically from these issues of the land grab. Now the problem is, uh, uh, not only this, uh, if you ask about like the, how the situation is between Christian and Muslims, I would let you know, just come in to Bethlehem and see what it feels like during Christmas. 
it's wonderful you can't imagine like I have Muslim friends more than Christians and they invite me to have dinner with them during Ramadan I invite them to have dinner with me during Christmas so it's amazing not all of this during Christmas uh, in Bethlehem we have the Nativity Church and we also have the manager square where we erect the Christmas tree so what happened is uh, and just to see how beautiful it is we Palestinians and uh, Palestinian Muslims and Christians and sometimes there are a few Jews who come and and celebrate with us we get together and we make a circle and we hold our hands together and we start praying in three languages Arabic English and Hebrew and you can't imagine how beautiful is that mm. just to give you a sense of hope it's wonderful so if you're asking about the situation or the relationship between the Palestinian Christian and Muslim it's more than perfect yeah. But of course, that doesn't mean that there are some few problems, of course. Just like any, 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 say any Arab countries where the Christians live today. Right. And as it is in any country, I mean, even in the United States. Yeah, there, even in the United States. Yeah, there are disagreements between, pe between mm -hmm. people. But that doesn't mean like they are facing right. a lot of problems between them because they only suffer from one problem, which is the occupation. Right. So they have to be united. So in some sense, the, the occupation is is creating a mm -hmm. closer bond absolutely. between Christians and Muslims. Absolutely, I would say that. Because they have a common... Mm -hmm. And probably this is one why, the, why in Palestine you would find the most fantastic or a great relationship between Palestinians and uh, Christian and Muslims. So, so everything we hear about, about the Muslims pushing the Christians out of the No, that doesn't make any sense, absolutely. Yeah, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't make any sense. So... I'm wondering what you personally mm -hmm. see happening. See happening. I wrote an article a couple uh, weeks ago before I come to the United States and uh, to say that if the occupation lasts for more than 10 years or so, the Palestinians today are boiling on a low temperature mm -hmm. because they are really frustrated and angry and they don't have anything left for them except to fight. So my, uh, my vision is what's going to happen if the con situation continues like this, where the Palestinians will continue to lose more lands and to lose hope, they will turn to violence. And soon enough, nobody will stop them. And this is exactly what happens to most of the people in Gaza. When you mentioned the word Hamas, of course, the, the word here in the United States are familiar with Hamas because they only hear when Hamas is firing rockets in Israel, but they never examine the situation that drives these people to, to this kind of violence. And I'll give you a similar situation that I saw here in the United States. I was in Baltimore uh, before I come here to Iowa. And, they and I was supposed to give a lecture to one of the churches called Huntington Church, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. I'm so bad at remembering names. But, uh, yeah, uh, but... Instead of uh, taking me to the church in order to give a lecture to the people, uh, they took me to one of the corners where the Afro-Americans are located today. And I've never expected to see the situation because I only saw it on, the tel on televisions and on TVs and on the news, but I never, I never expected to see it in reality like this. They live in a complete and abject poverty, no decent life, uh, no access to... Uh, to work, no access to jobs, uh, to water even. It's a complete disaster. I, can, I couldn't imagine, I couldn't, uh, I was really astonished and didn't believe myself. And actually, it kind of reminds me a lot of my people back home because this is what we live in. We live in abject poverty, no decent life, and etc. So the church mainly was engaged in providing these people as a way or give, to give them hope to, uh, to create a new ways for them to stay away from violence because these people have been seeking uh, guns and weapons in order to protect themselves. And uh, what we did is like we, we tried to provide them with free apples, free corn, just a way uh, to help them uh, overcome their situation. And uh, it kind of reminds me a lot because when people lose hope, they turn to violence. And this is exactly what happened to these Afro-Americans and exactly what happens to these people in Gaza today. Mm -hmm. Because they are, have been living under suffocated siege for more than uh, nine years or eight years and 
no one can get in, no one can goes out unless it's being controlled by the state of Israel. And when Israel claims that it has withdrawn from Gaza, it actually doesn't make any sense. Because today, what really makes sense is Israel is reoccupied Gaza by redrawing the map and continue the occupation and surrounding Gaza by a suffocated siege. And that's why these people lost hope. You can't imagine like 40% of unemployment today, the rate of the people inside Gaza. So you can't imagine how hard it is for these people. So when they lose hope, they turn to violence. And no wonder why we witness such fanatic movement like Hamas today. So in order to be reasonable and balanced about the situation, you have also to examine the, the, real, the real reasons why these people turn to violence. Not only, the, the story doesn't start from when you fire rockets inside Israel or when Israel retaliate. You also have to, because here in the United States, unfortunately, the mainstream media is completely unjust and actually, I would say, biased. Not only biased, I would say it's complicit in what has been happening to the Pussy. And not only complicit, but also responsible because for being, support, for being supportive of one narrative here, which is the Israeli one. So you never hear about what, has, what, happening, what happens to the Palestinians on a daily basis under occupation. You don't see on your television when a house is being demolished, when a land is being confiscated, when land is being taken. So you don't see the, the multiple faces of the Israeli occupation and what does it do to the Palestinians on a, day, on a regular uh, daily basis. So that's why it's so biased and that's why we always hear here one narrative and that's why they are con unconditionally supporting Israel because they think Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East and it has been providing the Palestinians every peace process that's so good for them. Yeah, it always amazes me when they say that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. First of all, it's not a democracy of all of its citizens, which by definition is what democracy means. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, Palestinians had a democracy. Mm -hmm. They democratically elected mm -hmm. Gaza, mm -hmm. or I mean uh, Hamas, Hamas to, mm -hmm. to, to rule them, and immediately the yeah, United States were, and Israel didn't yeah. like it. Exactly. So they, called, yeah. they decided they were a terrorist. Not only this, not only this, they gave the Palestinian people a collective punishment. Yep. They gave them a collective punishment for electing, according to them, a terrorist organization as Hamas today. So they give the Palestinian people, the whole Palestinian people, a collective punishment. They uh, cut the whole aid from them, an international aid, which basically which today, which is, which, today uh, which is today is considered like uh, the only main source of income for the Palestinians because they are totally depending on aid to build their state, unfortunately. But this is also another problem because I think the Palestinians have to, uh, to create a new economy for them. Uh, but also, like as I said, like they give them a collective punishment. And not only this, before I come here to the United States, Israel declared to confiscate a thousand acres from Bethlehem uh, to villages as a way to, co to punish the people in Gaza, or to punish the people in the West Bank for supporting the people in Gaza during their struggle. Right. And is, was Beit Jala affected? Well, of course, Beit Jala has been seriously affected and the two, two illegal settlements here has been expanding on a daily basis. More importantly, what I, what I usually share with my American, my fellow Americans, my fellow Christians here, is in Beit Jala today there are, uh, oh, actually there is the last population of Palestinian people. And just to give you a small uh, statistics, Beit Jala used to constitute 16,000 inhabitants of Beit Jala. Today there are less than 2,000. People have been flooding away and leaving because they thought like there is no hope. And there's no hope at the For example, my brother and my sister, they today live in the United States because they thought like, we want to raise a family and family means like you need a lot of money and uh, a lot of commitment and you need to work. And they're like, the, the salaries are not enough for, uh, to provide you the decent uh, income. And of course, that's exactly what Israel wants. Exactly. And that's part of the occupation. That's part of why the whole idea of the occupation. Just to give, just to, uh, just to say to the Palestinians, leave. This is not your home. This is ours. We want all. That's the one. They want the maximum land with the minimum people. And this is the whole idea of occupation today. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like what you think is going to happen, if if uh, nothing takes place in terms of um, uh, a solution, is to have 
is that they're going to turn the West Bank will turn to violence as well? Absolutely, I, I guess so because uh, I don't see any hope from the two-state solution today. If the situation continues like this, uh, literally the Palestinians they have no place to live in today. As I said, there are less than eight percent to live in, and it absolutely doesn't make any state. And then. <clears throat> and the the land that's left is is crisscrossed by mm -hmm. Israeli only yeah. roads. Yeah, bypass roads. You know, and checkpoints as and you check mentioned. Checkpoints. There and are more than 560 checkpoints throughout the West Bank today. Yeah, and you know, it's a, it's it, we need to point out again that that's on Palestinian land, mm -hmm. and the settlements, the roads, the uh, the checkpoints are all on Palestinian land. Mm -hmm. They they make great big. Um, what do they call it? Land between mm -hmm. disconnected areas. Yeah, you can call and <clears throat> so so they just in order to get that they destroy as you as you indicated continuing fields, olive trees that take what how many years to grow? Thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, thousands and, and thousands. so if you're asking me what's my solution, right? That solution is this, as I have been advocating since day one. They have to share the land, and which means a one-state solution for all, where everyone can live in equality and democracy between the Jewish and the Palestinians. I mean, even to understand what's happening, and that's why I've been advocating, and not only me, like several Palestinian intellectuals have been uh, uh, advocating that the only solution for this cause is one-state solution for all. Or if you want a two-state solution, but that was a long time ago, uh, if they accepted that in the beginning, uh, that could be sharing the land. But unfortunately, this is not possible today after Israel is continuing its occupation. So the solution left for both people is to one state solution. And the thing is, the thing is, uh, any idea, any idea to separate Jews, Christians, Muslims, does, it's, it's impossible. Why? They are intertwined in the history. And so that's why any segregation and any apartheid between these people will never work, will never ever work. So the idea of occupation is mean giving one people the right or the privilege on another people. And this will never uh, lead to justice or peace. They have to feel that peace is achievable or is feasible on the ground as they talk on the, on the televisions. So, as I said, my solution should be a one solution for all where everyone could enjoy democracy and equality and security for both people. What do you think the likelihood of that happening is? Mm. Well, I think it's difficult, it's very difficult, and it needs a lot of heart and commitment, and more importantly, knowledge. More important than knowledge. We need to mobilize ourselves and to, uh, and actually to create public awareness, especially here in the United States, to help achieving this kind of uh, uh, idea of a uh, solution. Because, oh, I'm sorry I didn't mention the first thing, like thank God for internet. Thank God for internet, which provides you a lot of alternative uh, resources, except other your mainstream media here, which you only listen to Fox, which is extremely biased and one uh, and actually one-sided uh, narrative. So you have to seek new media resources, mobilize yourself, and uh, create knowledge between these people who you're speaking to, and mobilize your representatives to keep pressing on the congressmen here in the United States in order to, just to show them like what all the resolutions have said or what they stated on that Israel have to withdraw from the 1967 borders and to give the Palestinians their own state. I mean, if you look at this, there has nothing to be negotiated on. So if your house is being stolen, what are you negotiating on? Uh, negotiating on? To return the door or to retain the window of that uh, house? You're going to negotiate on returning the whole house of it. So basically, there is no use of negotiating on getting uh, the door or the window of it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, this is a kind of program that has to work on that issue. But unfortunately, after two decades of peace, as I said, where there hasn't been any peace and there hasn't been any process, it's not achievable. So the only solution left is to keep pressuring Israel internationally and locally to end the occupation. Mahmoud Abbas just went to the UN mm -hmm. to ask for a two-state solution. I mean, uh, 
I don't want to say I'm, uh, I'm actually I'm against the whole idea of a two-state solution. So basically, I, you can consider me against the PA in general. And to give you just a small uh, idea of what I believe, I, I'm against actually four key players in this game, on this conflict. One of them is the PA for continuing the, Pal Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority, authority for continuing the supporting of the two-state solution. Secondly, Hamas for turning into violence, but of course that's unjustifiable and doesn't, make, doesn't uh, solve the problem. And third, of course, the Israeli occupation of the Israeli government for continuing the occupation and not giving the Palestinians the right to self-determination. And the, third, the fourth one is the, Isra the, Americans, the American government for supporting one narrative and actually unconditionally backing Israel without uh, any basis of any agreement. And of course, if you ask what, why we're not turning to right, uh, human rights, uh, uh, human rights organization, etc., we have been turning to human rights organization for several years, for, for more than, I don't know, two decades, th three decades. And unfortunately, when we go to the UN and you, you only face the American veto. Right. So basically, the American has been supporting Israel unconditionally and giving it, and like for example, the uh, American government gives $8 billion a day, $8 million a day for the Israeli military to continue its occupation and oppression of the Palestinian people. $3.1 billion, $3 billion a year. $3.1 billion a year. Billion. Billion a year. So you yeah. can't imagine. Yeah. So this has to stop one way or another if they're planning to achieve a just peace between these two people. Right. And uh, the, the problem is, and I don't know how much, <coughs> how familiar you are with the American process, mm -hmm. but the problem is that um, there's an, there is a lobbying organization yep. called APAC. APAC is Israeli. lobbying super hard. Yeah. It has been lobbying super hard. Not only this, because they control most of the sensitive positions in the United States. And, and just to give you an idea, probably before the two-state uh, two solution idea, the whole thing or the peace process, the United States used to control Israel. Today, unfortunately, Israel controls the United States. I agree. Why? Uh, just to give you a small example, today, no president can be elected for the United States unless he declare his unconditionally backing support for Israel. And unfortunately, Obama think, thought that he could do something. But unfortunately, he forgot that he has all congressmen and he's controlled by his Congress. And most of the Congress are uh, submitted to the APAC. I would say, oh, they have all the money for Israel and they're unconditionally supporting Israel because Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, of course. And what's all about is oil, money, and creating, or oh, oh, actually, I would say, defending themselves from the fanatic uh, Islamic movements such as Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran today. And how much <coughs> of, the, uh, of the unrest in the Middle East, in Iraq, mm. in Afghanistan, and the so-called, in Syria, the so-called ISIL, ISIS. how much do you oh, think ISIL, that yeah. this, this um, conflict, I guess we'll call it, um, is affected by the Israel-Palestine crisis. Do you think mm -hmm. that it has anything to do with that? Uh, unfortunately, uh, no. The situation, <coughs> the situation in the Middle East is completely different than what's because the Palestinians are obviously having an occupation and is different from what they're having as ISIL or ISIS in the Middle East. But the question here that needs to be asked to the Americans and to the Western people in general, like, how did these ISIS uh, gain their weapons or how they were created? And we have to go back in time and look at Syria, where they said that we have to fund these opposition and to give them uh, all our support in order to topple down the regime in Syria, the Assad regime. Because today, and in the Middle East and uh, in the Middle East policy, Syria is the only uh, country that's still standing, uh, that's still standing um, against the Israeli project in the area. I would say. So they wanted to topple down the regime after they toppled it in, Syria, in Egypt and in Iraq. And now it's turned down, it's, turned, it's the time for Syria. So what happened is, they funded these opposition, and it turns out that they are not a moderate. 
They turned out to be a fanatic, radical Islamic movement. And after a week or after uh, years of uh, funding them, today they have gained a lot of power and momentum in Syria. And they have been invading and thinking of and turning to radicals and try to spread out and create their illegal uh, state as an Islamic state. So when you think of when you think of uh, attacking or waging a war on ISIS today, you also have to think of, we created them in one way or another. Right. As in a Western people, we created them. I'm not saying that these, uh, these ISIS is like, uh, do not deserve to be killed or to be attacked. No, they, are, they don't represent Islam, first of all. And secondly, they're considered like, they're not animals, they are not human beings. They are animals, the way they are beheading people and killing them uh, in an awful way just unjustifiable and uh, it's really unjust uh, but if you're asking if it's affecting the the Palestinians, the Palestinians or the situation in Palestine Israel conflict no I don't think so it's mm. still far away it's still more in Egypt and Iraq and affecting the Christians who are living there I, I just wonder how much for example mm. if we if the United States did their part to um, I don't even know what I want to say. The word that comes to mind is fix, but of course they can't fix it. Mm. But if they would do their part to, to um, stop supporting Israel 100%, Absolutely. for example, I mean, a couple of things would do it, right? You stop giving them $3.1 billion a, get, a day, stop supporting them at the, at the UN, right there, the, 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 uh, the, the occupation and the siege, in, in Gaza, Gaza would probably collapse because they wouldn't be able to, to absolutely, use it. Absolutely, absolutely. Not so, only this, not only this. And so if, you fix, if we did that and either, either one of two things happens, either the UN steps in and decides, okay, we need to, we need to enforce this two-state solution because now Israel is no longer being supported at the Security Council, or two, as you suggest, there really isn't any you know, I, I, I agree with you that I don't think there is a two-state solution anymore. And, and they say, okay, we just want equal rights for the Palestinians. What, did you th what do you think would happen if, if that happened? Do you think that that would uh, have any impact in the rest of the Middle East? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, every American has to rethink or to, to question the, po the foreign policy of the United States in the Middle East today right. because it turns out like it's a disaster especially take Palestine as an example they have been claiming that they are supporting peace process which unfortunately turns out that they are only supporting and funding the state of Israel to continue its occupation they are buying more time for the Israelis to expanding the settlements and to create new ones and to make it life to make life for the Palestinians difficult there and basically force them to leave. What I want to say is, eventually, is I think uh, I'm not asking for the United States to, uh, to actually like to stop supporting Israel, but at least to be balanced about the situation here. If we're talking about a just and uh, peaceful solution in the region or in the state in this conflict, at least she has to be balanced about the peace process and balanced about whom she has to support and to stay stop for Israel stop to Israel and to end the occupation. Because as soon as you end the occupation, most of the problems will be solved in that area of the conflict. Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think where we have to start in the United States is by doing exactly what you're doing. It's by educating people. Mm -hmm. And then for them, those people, to put pressure on, uh, on, the, uh, on our representatives in Congress. Um, but as you mentioned, what we, what we go up against is, um, is the APEC lobby. Um, we have found, and I have many times, talked to my representatives and senators, and Iowa, as you may or may not know, has a unique opportunity to, mm -hmm. to talk to presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. And um, they are very reluctant, the ones that have been in the state so far mm -hmm. this, this round, have been very reluctant to engage about the Middle East at all. So, you know, mainly um, uh, we just, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, we just need, when, when President Obama 
made that speech in Cairo, in Cairo every some time. of us had high hopes. Yeah, but unfortunately it turns out that he's controlled by his government, right. by the Congress and by the APAC. I guess I still hold out a little hope that um, after this election, <laughs> site, you know, when, when we see what kind of a Congress we're going to yes. have, that maybe he'll step out and exactly. do something. And that's why I'm here in the United States to create public At awareness and to create knowledge for these people in order to understand what's happening to the Palestinians there and at the same time to help achieve a just peace between and between two states, an Israeli state, a Palestinian state, living side by side with peace and security. Yeah. We, we've got four minutes left. Do you want to leave our viewers any, any pointers on how to do that? Uh, or last uh, words? Last words, I would say. Uh, just, uh, uh, for example, I, what I suggest is a solution for this conflict or to help the Palestinian Christians who are, st who are suffering there today. Uh, I should invite you to the Holy Land to see by yourself what the Palestinians today are suffering, but also to witness the, Christ the, beautiful, the beauty and the compassion of Christianity practiced there. I think a physical presence will open your eyes to the harsh reality of what the Palestinians are going through for more than 40 plus years under the Israeli occupation. And secondly, as I said, the media is responsible for what has been happening to the Palestinians, especially here in the U.S., for supporting one narrative. So what I want you to do is educate yourself and educate your minds and hearts in order to be able to think out of the box and uh, mobilize yourself and keep pressing on your representatives and just put instead of in, in, in front of them the whole resolution which said that Israel has to withdraw from these occupied territories which is considered illegal according to the international law and every international consensus. So Israel, uh, we have to pressure Israel to end the occupation in one way or another if we want to see a just peace in the region between the Palestinians and the Israelis. I think those are wonderful ideas. And we do what we can, although it just seems like very little. Of but, course, you know, it writing, takes hard uh, work and yeah. a lot of commitment. Uh, letters to the editor continue to help um, spread the word. Um, we do bring in here in Iowa City. We bring, we do bring in speakers. You're going to be speaking at uh, the show. Will go on the air too late for people to catch it that haven't already. But we have speakers in just about every month to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, you could check out our website at www.iowapjp.com. PJP stands for People for Justice in Palestine. And there's another um, uh, www. What did we say? Presbyterianmission.org. Mm -hmm. um, we'll tell about the program that that George has been involved in. And I want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you for I having wanna, me. I want to thank you for talking about a very important issue. What I see is the, is the premier issue in, the, in, the, in foreign policy. And I thank you so much for what you're doing. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Yeah. Thank you.